Last chance. Twenty twenty one. He is passionate about engineering more secure crypto ecosystems and will explore the topic of software supply chain security and tell us why it is an existential threat to the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Please help me work welcome John Nalty. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I was here in 2019 as an audience member and I'm very proud to be speaking before you all today. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about software supply chain security and how I believe it poses an existential threat to the crypto economy. I think a lot of you are here because of the crypto economy. We're all kind of sailors on the crypto seas. So let's begin. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of theory, the actors in the space. We'll discuss the mechanics of supply chain attacks. Uh, as they relate to, to software and historical attacks there. Uh, and then we'll go into a little bit of like tactics and defensive measures that you can just think about, especially if you're in the software space. Then we'll close it off. And if we have time, I have appendix uh, with uh, some of the research I do in some of the crypto ecosystems I'm a part of. So a little bit about me. Uh, I have this philosophical value I like to hold. I stole it from Plutarchs and Socrates was said to say, I'm neither Athenian nor Greek, but a citizen of this world. I think if he was here today, he would say something like I would say. I am neither Californian nor American, but a citizen of this world, and I want my currencies to be so too. There's a lot of blood and cocaine on the US dollar, and I'm not always very proud of that. Some of the communities I've been a part of, uh, those kind of help define who I am and, and why I'm standing here today. The earliest one being Neurotech X. I helped create uh, this organization. It uh, uh, includes a bunch of people interested in the intersection of neuroscience and technology. Uh, a lot of these people work on open source medical hardware and software, which I think is a, a necessary requirement for a sustainable future. Um, I also form, or I'm part of this group, a disciple of Hashbang. It's not a religion, but it feels like a cult. Um, and they focus on digital privacy, digital freedom, and security. Uh, it's a very like all creatures welcome society. Anybody here can join. You don't really need to know technical things. And uh, yeah, if you want people to talk to you like me, join us on IRC or Element or whatever. Um, OpenSSF is a more legitimate organization. It's funded by Microsoft and Google, Red Hat, IBM, I think is a partner to Citibank. Um, it's an open source supply chain security foundation. And I recently became a, a, a contributor to this organization and trying to help them with a few different projects. Um, and then, yeah, there's a bunch of different crypto communities I'm a part of just because it's fun to be part of crypto communities. As far as companies go, you know, Coinbase is where I currently work. Um, I worked at Facebook for a little bit and Bitco and Nokia. I was also a legal secretary once and long term substitute teacher barista, computer repair technician, all kinds of things. But yeah, why are we here? Well, there's magic in the room. Um, there's magic in your eyes. There's magic in, in the air at Block Chance and in Hamburg. And uh, what got me here was uh, magic internet money. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a thing. And uh, originally, it took the form of Bitcoin. And now there's many different types of monies out there. And they're all kind of magical. And I'll kind of describe what I mean by magic later on. But I'm also a big fan of the Harry Potter series of books uh, by J.K. Rowling. So you might see references in and out of these slides. A little bit about Coinbase and our mission. It's to increase economic freedom in the world. And I align with that. I'm very happy to work at Coinbase. I'm very happy to work for a company that I can send my friends and family to to partake in this beautiful you know, open financial system the open money system. It's a very beautiful concept, and I'm glad society has reached this point. As my job is to be an infrastructure security engineer, I am supposed to help ensure and protect that freedom. And, and that's why I'm here today, with a message and a problem. So first, kind of let's get a little bit into like the terms I'll be using today. Loss, any undesired, you know, unplanned event that results in a negative impact. You know, there's a few examples here. Safety and security. I, I like to ask people the difference. 
what do you think it is? I mean, I kind of defined it up here already, but, um, you know, safety is to prevent losses due to unintentional actions by benevolent actors. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. It is human to make mistakes. And, and we have to develop systems and design, you know, systems that can prevent safety issues, you know, like critical systems, like airplanes have to have uh, multiple uh, failure safe scenarios where they can fall over to, fail over to another system in case something happens. And uh, the infrastructure I help build also has these mechanisms. If something happens, we have a failover, we can go to a different server in a different region if like, a certain uh, data center is down or whatnot. Security is a different concept. Security is a, <laughs> it prevent, you know, we're trying to prevent losses here with the intentional, you know, malevolence, intentional actions from malevolent actors. So people trying to do bad things to disrupt our systems. They're very similar in that they both are here to prevent loss, but they're different in the sense that there's intent in the loss for security problems. So I also have a few different premises. Attackers exist. I don't know really why they exist. You know, it's a human thing, I guess, to attack systems. People like to break things for greed or just for the lulls. Um, but yeah, there's a non-empty set of people or entities willing to do harm to some system. In this particular uh, talk, it's a crypto system. Uh, these critical systems, these critical crypto systems, they depend on open source software. OSS is open source software. And I think we're all kind of familiar with open source software. Raise your hand if you're not, or come talk to me afterwards. I can show you the wonderful world of open source. Um, and then, yeah, magic is just any phenomena that's not fully understood. If I, if I really like it and I don't really understand it, it just seems magical to me. And I don't know if you all have that same experience, but you know, it just really clicked when I read the Harry Potter books. So a little brief intro to the software uh, life cycle. You basically have developers, they store their source code into a source code repository. Uh, that source code repository, typically there's some type of event listener that causes a build to build. The build system requires dependencies from external sources like PyPy or NPM or you know, Ruby gems. These are external projects that you pull in as libraries to, to run your code. Uh, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Google, Microsoft, Coinbase, Facebook. Everyone uses open source code in these Fortune 500 companies, in these US governments, German governments, every government, every system. Um, and then eventually uh, we use this uh, software in a production system, whether it's the app running on your phone or in a data center somewhere, it's running. And now how can this be compromised? <laughs> in a lot of different places, actually. So we'll go over this, but all these red little, you know, words, these are bad things that can happen in this system, and that's like the, the main point of this talk, is bad things happen in the software supply chain. You know, it's kind of like uh, in America, sometimes uh, we get E. coli in our spinach, <laughs> and uh, basically our spinach source is compromised. It's like poisoning the well. People get sick, and we have to figure out how to trace it and how to contain it and mitigate the issue. And the same thing happens with the uh, source code. It can be poisoned. And who's doing this poisoning? Who's doing these bad actions? Well, we have a few different like levels of people I like to think about, you know, the nation state level, Lord Voldemort type of people, really scary. Individuals have no chance of defending themselves unless you're like Harry Potter. And there's no scar on my forehead, so I'm screwed. Um, organized syndicates, sometimes they're criminals, sometimes they're hacktivists, I guess they're it really depends on the jurisdiction if they're criminal or not, but they sometimes break systems for various reasons. And then you have individuals, and individuals can be extremely skilled, extremely unskilled. There's a variety of skills there, and they just typically have less funds to uh, host an attack. We live in a capitalistic society. Typically, the more money you have to throw out a problem, the higher degree of success you'll have. And so, yeah, who's everyone else? So we have your project maintainers, people who actually have right access to repositories. Think of like, I don't know if Linus Torvalds has right access to the Linux uh, kernel source code, but I'm sure he does, he's a project maintainer. Then you have random people who can contribute to projects. You have service operators, you have downstream users, and these are all, you know, we're all downstream users of some service. Now how can attacks happen? How can I get, if I'm an evil person, say today I woke up and I decide to be evil, 
how can I get my code to run on your system? And there's different ways to do so. And this is an enumeration of all those ways to get my code running on your system. I have a, a little bit of time left, so I won't go through all of them. And we'll just look at some examples. And then once I have my code running in your system, when do I execute? You know? And with supply chain attacks, uh, you actually see people infecting a package, infecting thousands of, of services downstream, but only executing malicious behavior in some of those services. And um, what's all this got to do with crypto? Well, crypto is based on an open uh, community. And it's based with the, it uses open code bases. And so all these evil actors in the space can see all of the transitive dependencies in, in your system, enumerate through them all, find weak ones that they can run, you know, get their code into, and they're running their code in your system. Um, you know, why would someone do this? Well, let's say they find a negative corollary between ETH and, uh, I don't know, Solana. Every time ETH goes down, Solana goes up. I have $10 million. I put $2 million on hacking Ethereum. And I put $8 million in uh, shorting Ethereum and maybe just buying some Solana coins or tokens or whatever. You know, some people do it for profit. Historical attacks, 1984, Ken Thompson, Turing Award lecture. Uh, he just brought up this problem, and he had a great experiment. Someone backdoored a compiler in one of the labs he was working in and was able to get admin access all the time. They couldn't figure it out. They finally figured it out. Um, backdooring the compiler means like compilers build the code, so if you backdoor the compiler, you can backdoor any code that's built with it. And he came to this conclusion, you know, perhaps it is more important to trust the people who wrote the software. It's a people problem. There's a social aspect to this problem. It's a community we're all a part of, and we all have to have trust and faith in this community. Some of us uh, can't trust it, though. You know, some of us have uh, issues with trust because we run too critical of systems. Another event, event stream, this was a hack that really woke, my, uh, woke me up to the scene. I was working at Bitco at the time. Bitco is a JavaScript house, a lot of NPM packages. This one targeted Copay, uh, which is a cryptocurrency wallet, and was able to, basically, someone needed to be a new maintainer for a project, and yeah, they gave the maintainer rights to someone who was evil, and they started running evil code on event stream. SolarWind, you guys might have heard of this. Really sad, sad face for Department of Defense and nine or eight other federal agencies in the U.S. government. 100 or more um, Fortune 500 companies are, Fortune 500 companies were impacted. Hundreds of private sector companies were impacted. And you know, if they, if SolarWind was building the, uh, their their code base like Bitcoin Core, they would have solved for this. A year later, they came back and they are solving for this. Sushi Swap, another attack. Bitcoin dev mailing list. So this is actually the point of this whole talk. Right now, there's an open attack going on on Bitcoin. I don't think you all know about that. But basically, someone said, hey, I'm going to attack your supply chain. Are you ready? When is that going to happen to Ethereum? When is that going to happen to Polkadot? And if you aren't in the cryptocurrency space, when is that going to happen to your code bases? You don't know. I don't actually have enough time for all of the defensive measures, but just you know, some basic principles, know your dependencies, treat them like your own children, don't give them junk food, make them exercise, know who they are, go talk to them. And what you see is not always get, what, what you see is not always what you get, verify, uh, and keys can always be compromised, and they will always be compromised, always have a rotation plan. These tactics aren't really that important. If you walk away with anything from this talk, remember, protect your digital identity, use two-factor authentication, uh, and don't rely on SMS for that second factor authentication. Try to buy a YubiKey, they're pretty cheap these days. These are a bunch of open source supply chain tools I use. I'll post these talks somewhere on like Twitter or something. So take a screenshot now, but don't worry. Some closing remarks. Hey, rise up. We need a positive future, and we're here to do that. So go find out who, uh, who the people are behind the critical open source projects that you depend upon. Go upstream. Ask them how they're doing. See how their day is. Maybe you can help improve their security posture. And stay in touch. You know, I'm part of OpenSSF, part of Hashbang. And yeah, learn about Matrix too. That's a way I communicate with people. And if there's any questions, I have no time, so sorry. This is my cat. <laughs> so bye. <laughs> Thank you, John. Everyone, John Nalti.
we will have questions later on in the panel. So yes. we welcome you back then. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you.